Let's take a couple of breaths. Okay. <sighs> Thankful to be here. All good. Rick Rubin is perhaps the most important record producer of the past 35 years, with a career that is now the stuff of legend. He founded Def Jam Recordings in his dorm room and took hip hop mainstream in the late 80s with a staple of influential artists like Public Enemy, The Beastie Boys, and Run DMC. Today, he is a multi Grammy award winning producer for dozens of artists as diverse as Johnny Cash, System of a Down, Neil Diamond, Jay Z, The Dixie Chicks, Slayer, The Red Hot Chili Peppers, Adele, Lady Gaga, and Kanye West, just to name a few. Rick's interest and curiosity isn't limited to a specific genre or to what's popular on the charts, and he spent his entire career getting the best out of artists by helping them step outside of their comfort zone. Rick is most recognizable for his long, white, impressive beard. He's often seen walking around shoeless in a white t-shirt and black shorts. He has a mystical quality about him, which goes a small way toward explaining why so many people refer to him as a guru. That beard, man, is powers in that beard. You can tell. Every time you scratch it, magic was flying in the air. I seen it. You're so goddamn free. <laughs> I think I'm free, but you're on a whole nother level of fucking free. Ruben is a non-traditional producer. He doesn't play any instruments and he can't operate a mixing board or a Pro Tool setup. In 2007, Rick told Esquire magazine, quote, I don't know anything about music. My job has very little to do with music. It has more to do with taste and culture and balance, end quote. Ruben operates as part fan and part philosopher. He's best known for his talents as a listener, with his ability to offer skilled notes on how artists can improve their songs, along with providing them a safe space to make music without commercial or external pressures. Rick knows what he likes and senses what the rest of the world will like as well. Even if you're not in the business of making music, there's a lot you can take away from the life of Rick Rubin, a man whose vision has consistently been light years ahead of his contemporaries. Frederick J. Rubin was born on March 10, 1963, to Michael and Linda Rubin. His father sold shoes and his mother was a housewife. Rick grew up in Long Island, New York, in a household where music was always playing. The Beatles was the first thing when I was probably five years old, four years old, five years old, six years old. The Beatles was, the Beatles and the Monkees mm. were sort of the thing. And then I probably stopped listening to music by the time I was seven or eight. I got into magic and I started learning about magic and being a magician. Rick would take the train from Lido Beach into Manhattan and hang out in magic shops. He said, quote, When I was 14, I had magician friends who were 60. I learned a lot from them. I still think about magic all the time. I always think about how things work, the mechanics of a situation. That's the nature of being a magician, end quote. When he was 14, he went to see a pediatrician because his neck was hurting him. The doctor told him it was stress and that he needed to learn to meditate. Thanks to this encounter, Rick has been practicing transcendental meditation since he was very young. Early in high school, Rick got into hard rock groups like ACDC and Aerosmith and then gravitated to the intense and angry sounds coming out of the punk rock genre. Soon he was playing guitar in his own punk band called The Pricks. At school, Rick said he felt like a loner, like he didn't fit in, like he wasn't a part of anything. That was until he noticed the black students at his school listening to a new and energetic type of music called rap. His high school was about 70% white and 30% black. The white kids were into Led Zeppelin, Yes, and Pink Floyd, which were groups that were all completely over, whereas the black kids were always waiting for the latest rap or scratch record to come out. He found it fascinating that people could be so musically progressive that they'd want the newest thing, love it, and forget everything that came before it. Rap was like the hardcore punk movement, except the black teenagers actually accepted new music. 
and Rick did too. Although he'd play in another punk band called Hose, Rick was becoming increasingly enamored by rap music. It wasn't shiny. It wasn't polished. It was raw and felt more poetic and personal. No one got into hip hop at that time thinking it was going to be their road to success. Rick was encouraged by his parents to be a lawyer and enrolled at New York University in 1981 as a philosophy major with the intention of going to law school. Choosing NYU proved to be one of the most important decisions of Rick's life because it placed him exactly where hip hop was happening. Every night he'd go to local hip hop clubs where he was the only white person in attendance. I didn't take any classes before three in the afternoon because I knew yeah. I wouldn't wake up. I would go to these clubs like Negril and the Roxy and see what was going on there. And the, the, the records that were coming out didn't reflect hip hop. Hip hop was a whole interactive culture. And the DJ, the reason in the Def Jam logo, the DJ is big <laughs> is because the DJ was a key piece of the hip hop world. But the records at the time didn't reflect that. So really the goal of making records was more, almost like a documentarian of like, I'd go to these clubs, I'd hear this incredible music, then I would buy the records and they wouldn't be anything like it. And just from the fan point of view of wanting records that sounded like what I heard at the club, I started making them. One of Rick's first friends in the hip hop scene was DJ Jazzy J, who spun at the hottest clubs and would give Ruben advice on which records to buy. In 1983, the pair decided to make their own record with Jay's brother, T. LaRock, called It's Yours. It's yours! This track took off in New York's hip hop clubs and rap radio stations during the spring of 1984 and led to Russell Simmons reaching out to meet Rick. Russell was already notable on the scene for being the manager of popular acts like Run DMC and Curtis Blow. When the two first met, they vibed right away because they both liked all the same records. Rick told Russell that he wanted to start an independent record company and wanted him to be his partner. But Simmons was hesitant because he wanted to make a deal with a major label, but Rick was insistent. He didn't want to do it at first. And, uh, and I said, I'll make the records and I'll do all the work and you be my partner. And the more I got to know Rick, the more I felt that my efforts should go into the partnership and not into a separate company. Because I already had Run DMC and Houdini and Jimmy Spicer and Curtis Blow and the Fields Four. I was managing a lot of acts. I had a lot. I knew that if he was involved, it was a real label, whereas if I was doing it myself, it was a kid in a college dorm. So while he was still student at NYU, Ruben borrowed $5,000 from his parents to start the Def Jam label with Russell Simmons. In late 1984, their first release was a 12-inch single of LL Cool J's I Need a Beat, and it sold 120,000 copies. Def Jam's next single was a BC Boys track called Rock Hard, which had massive crossover appeal and showed the label was on the right track. These two records did well enough critically and commercially to have Columbia Records give him and his partner a seven-figure distribution deal for their Def Jam label. Ruben broke the news to his parents that he was going into the music business by sending them a photo of the first check he received under the Columbia agreement. It was his way of telling them they shouldn't think he was throwing his life away just because he was skipping law school. The amount of the check was a cool $600,000. And the rest is history. Def Jam became a symbol of adventure and independence in the music world, and Rick established himself as a producer whose name on a record was a virtual guarantee of quality. 
In a 1986 interview with The Village Voice, a then 23-year-old Rick Rubin said, quote, Def Jam is a unique label in that we're in the music business, whereas all the other record companies are in the banking business. They loan money, you make a record, you pay it back with your sales, and they take a piece from then on. They look at it as selling something. It's really disgusting, end quote. From the very beginning of his career, Rick never focused on trying to make a hit. Instead, his goal is to make music that excites him and the artist. We didn't make them thinking, oh, this is gonna change the world or I can't wait for everybody to hear it. It was more like, I know my friends are like this. Mm. And if, you know, if 500 people hear it, that's amazing. You know, if we can sell enough of these to get to make another one, we've succeeded. By maintaining a sincere approach to the art, Rick incidentally changed the face of music forever. During his time at Def Jam, he produced seminal hip-hop albums like LL Cool J's Radio, Run DMC's Raising Hell, and BC Boy's License to Ill. With the BC Boys, Rick combined his three favorite styles, punk, rap, and heavy metal, into one. And despite its offensive nature, it became the first rap LP to top the Billboard charts. Ruben also produced Slayer's 1986 album, Rain and Blood, which is now considered one of the greatest heavy metal records ever. This album includes dark lyrics pertaining to death, insanity, and murder, and it was considered so outrageous that Columbia Records refused to release it, so they had to bring it to another label. At the time, Rick was quoted saying, Who said rock and roll was supposed to be nice? Rock and roll is about going against the rules. End quote. In a few short years, Def Jam had become one of the most significant music labels in the world. But Rick and Russell were no longer getting along. They weren't aligned from a music or a business standpoint. There was no real falling out. It was really, and I can remember going out to lunch with Russell and saying, you know, I feel like we'd be better friends if we weren't partners. Do yeah. you want to leave the company? He's like, I don't want to leave. It's like, okay, I'll leave. It was like as simple as that. A lot of people would have stayed at Def Jam in Rick's position because it was so profitable, but he's not too attached to things. He didn't find the partnership fun anymore. So in 1988, he left Def Jam and headed across the country to Los Angeles where he started his next record label, Deaf American Recordings. Rick didn't plan on moving to California permanently, but once he got to LA, he never left. With his new record company, he changed gears and signed hard rock bands like Slayer and Danzig, and made several comedy records with controversial comic Andrew Dice Clay. Oh, Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her old dog a bone. She bent over. Rover took over. <laughs> she got a bone of her own. I don't know. Rick said, quote, after my initial success in rap, I started making rock records and people said, why would you do this? I made a comedy album and they said, why this? Pretty much every step of the way, people tried to talk me out of what I was doing next. The label's first major commercial success came with the Black Crow's 1990 debut album, Shake Your Money Maker. And two years later, the group's follow-up, The Southern Harmony and Musical Companion, gave Deaf American its first number one album. In 92, rapper Sir Mix-a-Lot earned a number one hit with the song Baby Got Back, as well as a platinum-selling album called Mac Daddy. Heavy metal act Slayer also enjoyed commercial success with several gold certified albums. In 1993, Rick changed the label name to American Recordings. He chose to drop the word deaf after seeing the word added to the dictionary where it was defined as a slang word meaning excellent. To him, the word had become mainstream and meaningless, so he held a mock funeral for the word on August 27, 1993. We had a funeral at the Hollywood Forever Cemetery for the word deaf. Al Sharpton was the minister presiding over the ceremony. The purpose of the event was to acknowledge the mainstreaming of the underground. And it ended up being a mainstream news story, which was funny because it was such a ridiculous idea to begin with. Around this time, Rick gained more notoriety when he produced the Red Hot Chili Peppers' fifth studio album, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, which gave the band their first hit, Give It Away, which won a Grammy Award and became the band's first number one single on the rock charts. Ruben was impressed when he first saw the Peppers on stage at the Greek Theater in 1989, but was even more impressed by their potential. 
The producer felt the Peppers were limited in the way they saw themselves as a funk group with rap lyrics. He knew they could play rock on a much wider scale if he could break down the walls in their own imagination. We were a great live band when we had a power that was really unique and every time we got in the studio it all changed. All of a sudden, well, in the studio you can't just go play, you have to get all these buttons lined up and you have to do this and this and it always just didn't sound like us, it was just stiff, weird. We got with Rick and it was just like, get in a room, put up mics and start playing music. That was a cool little <laughs> See that? That should be the vibe. Like what you just... Uh, yeah. It is so hard because there's so little time in each thing. But just keep them really simple. Ba-dum, ba-da-dum. Okay. Uh, Ruben's productions tend to be pared down and powerful. He goes about making music instinctively and pushes artists to find the inner them, to look at what they might be or didn't know they could be, and letting it all flow out from there. Rick encouraged the Chili Peppers to think in wider terms, and would meditate with band members before each studio session. He said, quote, There's a great deal of bullshit that people think about when they make music, things that don't matter. Meditation kind of wipes that away, and you focus on the real job at hand, as opposed to thinking about what the management wants, or what the record company is saying, or what somebody at a radio station might think. End quote. Ruben would go on to produce six albums with the Chili Peppers, and it'd be one of the most successful collaborations of his career. Starting in 1993, Ruben entered a creative partnership with country legend Johnny Cash that turned into a magical 10-year run. Back in the late 60s and 70s, Johnny Cash was one of the biggest rock stars of his day. He had multiple best-selling albums, his own popular TV show, and performed in large sold-out arenas. But the Cash that Rick first met backstage in February 1993 was in a much, much different position. Cash hadn't released a top 10 country album since 76. His longtime record label Columbia, which he helped build, dropped him in 86, and he was now performing in small, dingy clubs. For all intents and purposes, he was washed up. But Rick was looking for a new set of challenges as a producer. Instead of working with more young and established rockers, he wanted to connect with someone who was quote, great and important, but wasn't doing their best work. I wanted to see if I could help him do great work again, end quote. Cash was skeptical when he was told a rap producer wanted to work with him, but didn't have anything to lose. I can remember having a conversation with Johnny Cash saying on our first album, saying, we're going to make the best album you ever made. And he looked at me like I was insane. Like, like, how, like how could you even think that way? He felt like he hadn't made a good record in probably 25 years and had been discarded. You know, at the time that I met him, he was playing at dinner theaters and had been dropped from two labels and nobody cared so the idea of reframing the experience to to not to not just well let's just get in let's just do an album but let's do whatever it takes for it to be the best album you've ever made reuben and cash began recording on may 17 1993 rick set up simple recording equipment in his house and asked cash to play some of his favorite songs this went on for weeks the two shared music and stories and formed a close bond. In the following months, the pair recorded over 70 solo acoustic demos that they narrowed down to 13 songs on the album that Ruben named American Recordings. Upon release, it became Cash's best-selling album since 1971's Man in Black and won a Grammy for Best Contemporary Folk Album in 1995. Ruben and Cash would go on to make several more albums, which led to hits like The Man Comes Around and Hurt, a cover of a Nine Inch Nail song that may be the most powerful record of both of their careers. Their partnership and friendship continued until Cash's death in September 2003. Because Rick was willing to look past age and commercial viability, he resurrected Johnny Cash's career and brought the world a ton of great music that can be enjoyed forever. I feel like it's really, uh an issue with our society that we really discard good things before their time just because they get old or look a little ragged. I, I don't think age in any way took away from Johnny's greatness and in many ways as he got older and even as his voice may have gotten um, weaker, it somehow was able to convey emotion in an even deeper way. 
In the new millennium, Rick found himself working with some of the most charismatic and talented artists of all time, starting with Jay-Z. Rick ain't normal, I don't give a fuck. I know our producers have their idiosyncrasies, meaning, you know, quirks or some weird shit. But he's just strange by strange standards. While we was downstairs doing hardcore rap records and shit, upstairs he had a bunch of people having koala leaves and doing some type of Tibetan freedom concert planning. <laughs> and when was the last time you seen a bison in a nigga's studio? Next to the Johnny Cash Reels. Yeah. Yo, this nigga had a, a, a Grammy. I told you? Uh-uh. I was upstairs and they got a behind the shit. He had a Grammy for best uh, producer of the country album. Oh, yeah? This is just chilling. In the back somewhere. Nigga that done LL. Johnny Cash, Beastie Boys. Jay was working on the Black Album, which was set to be his final album before retiring, and he brought in Rick to produce the song 99 Problems. I wanna hear that, yeah. Yeah, cause I wanna fill in, I wanna fill in it, yeah. That's I'm thinking it. maybe we start a cappella with, um, if you're having girl problems, I feel bad for your son. I got 99 problems, but a bitch ain't one hit me. Bomb, <laughs> right into the first so verse. I got the rap patrol, yeah, yeah. that's that's money. Moments like this one, with the Jay-Z acapella suggestion, have created Rick's unshakable myth. It's how he developed an aura that every musician wants around them while they work. In the past two decades, Rick has produced some of the most famous and diverse musicians alive, including Rage Against the Machine, Slipknot, Weezer, Neil Diamond, Dixie Chicks, Justin Timberlake, Adele, and Lana Del Rey. Rick said, quote, I really like the challenge of working with different kinds of music. Working with different artists makes for interesting experiences. I feel like they help me at my craft by helping me push the boundaries of what I've done. If all I ever did was make hip hop records, it would get old. I think that both my ability to do it and the inspiration that I bring to it would wear out, end quote. One of my favorite Ruben produced projects is Kanye's classic 2013 album, Ease Us. Before Rick got involved with the project, Kanye came over to play him the album. He originally came over and, and said, hey, I want to come play you my new album. And I thought we were going to listen to a finished album. And then we listened to about three hours of music, most of which didn't have vocals. And, um, and at the end of it, it's like, wow, so what's, you know, what's it going to be? I'm thinking it's a, a year away. And he's like, well, you know, I'm putting it out in, uh, I think it was like six weeks, five weeks, coming out in five or six weeks. And really? And it's like, I, I said, you know, I have another album that's, a lot further along than this, and it's not coming out for probably five months. Yeah. And, uh, and he's like, really? It's just a funny conversation. After the meeting, Wes asked Rick if he'd be willing to take all the raw material and strip down the sound to help him finish the album. Three weeks before deadline, the pair worked furiously to cut down and reassemble the album. Rick said, quote, We ended up working probably 15 days, 16 days, long hours, no days off, 15 hours a day. We talked a lot about minimalism. My house is basically an empty white box. When he walked in it, he was like, my house is an empty white box too, end quote. Ruben said Kanye was recording two days before Yeezus needed to be complete, with five songs missing vocals and a couple more without lyrics. Rick remembers Kanye saying, quote, don't worry, I will score 40 points for you in the fourth quarter, end quote. In the two hours before Kanye had to leave to catch a plane to Milan, he finished all the lyrics and performed them flawlessly. In the end, we are left with a minimalist 10-track album that is aged like fine wine. Ruben is the producer that artists trust most when they have too many ideas and need to make most of the music disappear. Yeezus turned out incredible because Rick did precisely that. Uh, well I didn't reduce it. Rick Rubin, Rick Rubin reduced, reduced, it. reduced yeah. it. He's not a producer, he's a reducer. <laughs> nice. The number of production credits that Rick Rubin has at this point in his career is truly mind-boggling. There's no question he's one of the great music producers of our time. But to really get to the core of Rick's essence and his mystical creative process, we have to go to his iconic Malibu recording studio, Shangri-La. <laughs> Located in the California hills above Zuma Beach is Shangri-La, one of the most famous recording studios in the world. 
surrounded by a lush yard with the sound of ocean surf in the backdrop. The space allows artists to remain connected to the natural world, which is a stark contrast to most dark recording studios. It was originally built in the mid-1970s for Bob Dylan, but ever since Ruben purchased the property in 2011, Shangri-La's allure has ramped up by his own allure. When he got the property, he had almost every surface painted white, minus the pink tile countertops in the kitchen and bathroom. The studio's director of operations told Architectural Digest, quote, Generally speaking, the creative process is subtractive. You have to remove as many distractions as possible. One of the things that Shangri-La does really well, with its minimalist design, is taking away the distractions of clutter. There's not a television, there's not a clock telling you what time it is, it's like a blank canvas, end quote. The goal is to create a, a setting where an artist can be completely vulnerable and feel completely free to be themselves 100% with no, no shame or feeling of needing to perform a certain way or, and no expectation, the only, you know, just really a safe place to be naked, mm. basically. Back in the summer of 2014, Mac Miller was on tour in Europe and hit a low point. His drug addiction was getting out of hand, so he drunkenly gave Rick a call. Up to that point, the pair had only met a few times at Shangri-La. I went over there a few times, and then, um, you know me, we hang out three times, you're now my best friend, so, right. <laughs> so I'll call you and I when I'm depressed. So I was just drunk and thinking about life, and I was like, you know what I would love doing when I got home is like get my shit together. Rick Rubin, <laughs> <laughs> you have your shit together, you're still alive, um, let's do this. Getting clean doesn't just happen, not even within the safe confines of Shangri-La. Part of his detox was from recording music. Max said, quote, I'd just go to Rick's house every day and just sit and play the keyboard. Before then, I never really played music unless I was recording it. For two to three years, I was just numb. So when you're coming out of that, it's all gonna come out at once. I was crying every day, end quote. That summer, Rick helped Mac focus on living again and going outside and getting his priorities right. He never did get 100% sober, but after their summer together, Mac's outlook on life seemed much more positive. Ruben helped give Mac an extra four years of life, where he'd go on to make the best music of his career. This is one story, but it seems that Rick's primary role today has shifted more to a therapist than a traditional music producer. Some artists need help with their material, while others might need to be talked off the ledge to get out of bed in the morning. And Rick can do both. Today, he has some of the most profound interviews on YouTube with icons like Kendrick and Pharrell. And he currently hosts an audio podcast called The Broken Record, where he sits down with the most influential artists alive. I want to play you a clip from his conversation with Andre 3000, which is one of my favorite interviews ever. It provides us a glimpse at the type of therapy Rick offers through mere conversation. I haven't been making much music, man. My... My focus is not there. My confidence is not there. Um, I'd like to, but it's just it's just not coming. I think you make a lot of you start making a lot of things with no thinking mm -hmm. of what it's supposed to be or who's it for or what anyone else is going to think, but just get in the habit of making a lot. That's what I got to get back to. Yeah, yeah, just make a lot, and then at some point in that process, you'd be like. Hmm, I really like this. It did, and you didn't know, like through through that whole process, you don't know when that's gonna happen. Yeah. It's not a decision you make, and it's not an intellectual idea where I have a vision and I'm gonna make this thing like it doesn't it doesn't happen like that. It rarely happens like that. It happens more just having fun, Doing making it. things, no stakes. <laughs> Rick Rubin is responsible for countless evolutions in music over the last 30 years. From founding Def Jam to working with the Beastie Boys to reviving Johnny Cash's career to being brought in to save Yeezus last minute. He is behind hundreds and hundreds of beloved records. Yet somehow, even after absorbing the entire history, it's still difficult to explain the legacy of a man who doesn't appear to do much while doing everything at the same time. Perhaps if you push everything aside, 
Rick's superpower is simply his willingness to listen. If you really listen to what people say, usually they tell you everything. I just really pay attention to what people say, and through that I can then reflect back thoughts that they've told me about themselves that they don't know about themselves. <laughs> and um, allow them to unlock those doors to to get to the places they want to go artistically. A lot of answers are already within us. It just may require saying things out loud or having someone say it back to you for it to stick. Music producers come from different backgrounds and that usually determines the kind of music they make. Rick approaches his craft from the perspective of a fan and the fact that he's a fan of lots of different genres gives him an edge over others. For example, most famous hip-hop producers only exist in the rap genre and use the popular sounds and textures of the time. These producers want to make sure their imprint on the track is obvious, so they advertise themselves with loud producer tags. Oh lord, Jesse made another yeah, one. Yeah, on the track. Mike Wilmer. Yo, Pierre, you want to come out here? Rick Rubin takes the complete opposite approach. He tries to take himself out of it as much as possible. And the lack of any specific Rick imprint is actually what makes him so significant and rare. There's no one that listened to the new Strokes album, The New Abnormal, that could tell that it was produced by Rick Rubin. And that's the entire point, and it's been this way from the very beginning. Reduced by Rick Rubin is written on the back cover of LL Cool J's 1985 debut album, Radio. The bearded super producer's ethos has always been reduction, minimalism, and total stillness. In Rick's mind, the more invisible, the better he is at his job. You're sort of an absence, in a way. I try to be. It's, I try to be as... My goal would be to be able to produce an artist and have it be their best work and never meet them or speak to them. That would be the ultimate version of it. I've not gotten there yet. I haven't reached that level of skill yet. <laughs> The true magic of the creative process is that there's no magic. You simply set aside time and start working. It's like fishing. Mm. You know, you can, you can go out fishing, but you can't say, I'm going to catch three fish today. You know, it's like there's, we have very little control over this process. It's magic, really. I think if your goal is to be better than you were, it's a more realistic place to be. And if you write a better song than you wrote yesterday, every day, then you continue to get better and better and better. And it really is small steps. And trying not to think too much, it's more emotion and heart work than it is head work. It's like the, the head comes in after to look at what the heart has presented and to organize it. But the initial inspiration comes from a different place and it's not the head and it's not an intellectual activity. It's more inspiration. Thank you.